Do you care about music, art, and literature? I sure as hell hope you do. Are you an artist, musician, or writer? Are you curious about the creative process, about what goes through the hearts, minds, and souls of people who are creating? My guest today, Mia Funk, not only paints and writes, but she interviews accomplished creators as part of the Creative Process Exhibition, which was founded at the Sorbonne and is traveling to 40 leading universities around the world. On today's show, I'm going to talk with Mia about her own work, about the Creative Process Exhibition, and much, much more. So don't go anywhere. Matthew Felix on Air starts now. Welcome to Matthew Felix on Air, people who create, people who make a difference, coming to you from Paris, France. Quite a week here in Paris uh, with the devastating fire that rad ravaged Notre Dame Cathedral. My guest today, Mia Funk, and I were actually at an event very near Notre Dame while the fire was taking place, and we were able to watch the firefighters uh, battling the blaze. I don't know that I can say anything that hasn't already been said and probably said much better, but... Um, you know, beyond lamenting the tremendous loss, not only to France, but quite frankly, to all of humanity. And our immense gratitude to all those who worked uh, so hard and risked so much to limit the damage and save, um, you know, not only the structure, what could be saved with the structure, but some of the, the, uh, the priceless works that were inside the church. And of course, hoping for the best possible outcome, given the circumstances and what's even possible, uh, of what is sure to be a long, very involved restoration effort. Changing gears, I'd like to mention that unlike all of my other shows to date, my shows that I'm doing here in Paris are recorded, I'm having to record them ahead of time due to technological limitations. So other than acknowledging the Notre Dame tragedy, I don't really have much in the way of news. I do want to add, however, that the video version of this episode will likely be unavailable until the beginning of May because of slow internet, slow internet connections where I'm staying in France and I've been to a couple friends trying to find a faster one and have been unsuccessful thus far, so I'm going to keep looking, obviously, but uh, in most, most likely, the video version of this episode will not be available until the beginning of May. The good news, however, is that no issues with the audio with the podcast version, so those will be posted uh, at the regularly scheduled day and time, which is Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific. No show next week, May 5th, because one, I will be extremely jet-lagged, and two, I will be reading as part of the, um, the Stranger Than Fiction literary event in San Francisco. For those of you who are local to the Bay Area, Stranger Than Fiction is a long-running event hosted by Francis Stroh and uh, Alan Black at the Edinburgh Castle Pub. The next event is Sunday, May 5th, May 5th from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, so if you're local, please stop by. Litquake co-founder Jack Bulware, who's been a guest on this show, and uh, he'll be one of the readers, as will Rachel Howard, author of the new novel, The Risk of Us, and Julia Shears, author of A Thousand Lives, The Untold Story of Jonestown. Those are three very, very accomplished writers, and uh, I'm just honored to be, to be amongst them and part of this event um, taking place Monday, or sorry, Sunday, May 5th, like I said. Okay, after this quick message from my sponsor, Wordspace Studios, I will be back with author, artist, and creative process exhibition founder, Mia Funk. A quick thanks to Wordspace Studios in San Francisco for sponsoring Matthew Felix on Air. Wordspace's mission is to bring together writers and thinkers of all ages and experiences. Wordspace will soon be offering creative writing workshops, a literary book club, and guided writing groups. And Wordspace is already offering writing residencies. They are submission-based, and they provide writers with room and board for up to one month. To find out more, you can email info at wordspacestudios.com. Mia Funk is an artist, author, and interviewer. Mia's portraits of writers and artists appear in many public collections, including the United States Library of Congress, Dublin Writers Museum, Office of Public Works, the Centre Culturel Hollandais de Paris, and other museums and culture centers, including the American Writers Museum in the near future. Mia was commissioned by the Guinness Cork Jazz Festival to paint their 30th anniversary commemorative painting of over 20 jazz legends. Her paintings of Francis Bacon and Lucien Freud won the Thames and Hudson Picture Works Prize and were exhibited in Brussels for Bacon's Centenary, in Paris at the American University, as well as at international arts festivals throughout Europe. 
Mia has received many awards and honors, including the Prix de Peinture from the Salon d'Automne de Paris and has exhibited at the Grand Palais, also in Paris. She served on the National Advisory Council of the American Writers Museum from 2016 to 2017 and is on the advisory board of the European Conference for the Humanities. Last but far from least, as if she hasn't done and accomplished enough, as we're going to discuss at length today, again, Mia is the founder of the Creative Process Exhibition, which is an exhibition and international educational initiative traveling to leading universities around the world. Welcome, Mia. Thank you, Matthew, for having me. Thanks for being here, and thanks for your patience as we played around with the lights for uh, for quite a while before uh, before finally being being able to do this. Um, so uh, I know you live not too from not too far from Notre Dame, and we were together, like I said, a couple nights ago, yes. and uh, that was quite quite a night. So how are you feeling, sort of? in the aftermath of all of that? I think that the, yes, I mean, I live two streets away from it, so I yep. would see Notre Dame every day, but I think that all of us who live in Paris and in other parts of the world, we've seen, I've been heartened by the enormous outpouring of concern and how, uh, you know, notable families that's in France came forward, so we are mm -hmm. saving her, and uh, it, she, I understand now, which was, was quite devastating as we saw it, was to watch the, the roof burning, and I understand that that was a controlled burn. Oh, really? I didn't hear that. Uh, that's I believe that's right. It's because they didn't want to have... Um, they wanted it to burn out so that the rest of the cathedral would not have uh, fire damage, oh, or water okay. damage. Mm -hmm. um, a water damage, yeah. So, so I just... I admire how everyone came together, and I was moved by the way ev everyone was moved. We felt that, for those of, particularly of those of us who've lived here, but also many of us who've just are passing through. Yes, it is, right? Yes, that uh, you know she is really part of our collective memory, and even for those of us who are from different faiths or who don't who don't believe in that way, right? You know, right? And so it was interesting yeah. because it's what you're watching in a sense is the time burning, you know, mm -hmm. although much is saved, so we feel um, better about it now. And what you're seeing is, I mean, many of us have memories of going in the ice and have memories of going in there as a girl and now as a woman and Christmases I spent there, New Year's I spent under the roof. And I think of, you know, the prayers that were whispered there and the wishes and the confessions and the music. So what we see is we're talking about the creative process is that Notre Dame is more than a building, right. it's a collective artwork right. that was made by many hand, many anonymous hands yep. over the years. Yep. And uh, so to me, that's an example of what the arts can do to unite people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and like you said, is it Pinot who uh, says he's going to donate 100 million over, euro, I think? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get, we don't yeah. want to talk about but, money in France. Right. No, <laughs> yes. no, okay, sorry. It's significant. But it's in the newspaper. It's on yes. the front page of Le Monde. So we can mention that one. Uh, but then also there was a fund launched today. Uh, yes. I think it was today that it was launched to, to gather funds. And they've already collected a tremendous, almost... I can't remember what the fund was, but point being, yes, it will be rebuilt and it is bringing oh, no, people together and probably. that is the, uh, yeah. Okay. So how long have you, so you mentioned that you, again, or we both mentioned that you live near, near there. How long have you actually lived in Paris and where are you from originally? I don't actually. I was, I was born in America. Right. I've lived, I don't know. I mean, I've, I came to Paris first when I was 15 uh -huh. and then I lived in other countries in Europe. Uh huh. And so uh, I consider myself European now, but I'm very fortunate to have a number of collaborations and the traveling exhibition, which is, uh, has the participation of many um, American universities and um, cultural organizations. Yeah, so we'll students. get to that. So you've, yeah. you've lived all over is the short answer. Oh, the sh like, you yeah. want the short answer? No, no, no I don't want the short answer. I'm just summarizing. <laughs> you've lived all over it because you said lots of different countries in Europe. Or it's not a just, few, yeah. yeah, there are a few. Okay. <laughs> So speaking of you and your bio, you are a visual artist, which we're going to talk about at length. But mm -hmm. it sounds to me, just given what I, you know, the research I did before today, that your mm -hmm. first love is actually writing. Yes. So can you talk about how, how you kind of got started in writing? Well, I think, well, language is really, I really love storytelling of all kinds, but I like the, uh, I've always appreciated the written word. I think there's something very fascinating about being able to read a book well, you're really submerging yourself in somebody else's perception of the world. You're really being able to absorb their thoughts. So that's mm -hmm. very fascinating for anyone, whether they're writers or not. And so I was in love with language from the time um, I was three and I learned to read. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and it's been a lifelong passion. Yeah. And what sorts of things do you typically write when you are when you're working on your own projects? What sort of? Uh, I write short fiction. I also have written. I mean, I wrote a novel when I was um, nineteen, twenty. So mm -hmm. that was my first uh, career path. But then I got into painting, which had also always been, I'd always been surrounded by artists mm -hmm. from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So I found that was kind of the path of least resistance. It was nice. And what, why is that? What was it about painting? You, like you said, you had started out in, as writing. What was it that sort of navigated you towards painting as more of a focus? I mean, you still do both, but as more of a focus, what was it about painting that drew you in, so to speak? Um, I just found it... It's not that I left behind writing, but I understood the process of making, making a painting as a product mm -hmm. um, better. Mm -hmm. And um, no, it, it, they're still both part of my uh, process. And you'll notice even in the traveling exhibition, the creative process, that it combines um, language and visual arts and film and projection. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say I felt it to be easier, but what for me, making an image and make and reproducing a likeness and things like that uh, do not necessarily always, it's not true for everyone, but you can remove your emotions from the process a bit more. I feel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but of course I know I have conversations with many friends who are visual artists and they put all of their emotions in it, but I just know we can call them sometimes the plastic arts. And I think you can turn off your emotions a little bit Interesting. more. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And and with writing, I don't really think you can. Mm -hmm. You're you more implicated to. emotionally. In... Well, yeah, it's mm -hmm. more your your story, whether or not you're telling your own story, unless it's journalism, is always going to be in there, and you have to be convincing sentence by sentence and believing yeah. it. Yeah, I yeah. really think so that I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I'm always curious because about people who are both gifted with both the written word and the visual arts, because mm -hmm. I am not. And so it's just interesting to, for, to, to talk with people who are gifted at both and sort of what aspects of the written word versus what aspect of the visual arts sort of speaks to them and when they're drawn to one versus the other, particularly if you continue to do both, such as, such as yourself. Mm. Well, I think that uh, for me, I mean, I think I have uh, artworks that come directly out of my imagination, but it's always a response to something I've seen. And then it might be a response sometimes with imaginative portraiture or straightforward portraiture. It's, it's, an, it's a response to um, the creative works that I've been, um, say it's a film director mm -hmm. or a writer or a dancer or whatever, mm -hmm. something I'm responding to them. And I think somehow in writing it has to come more from inside you. Well, it, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for your process, sure. Mm -hmm. On your website, you say, quote, my work has primarily focused on semi-transparent figurative paintings and portraits, often revolving around the motifs of nature and the sea. So let's start with, because we're going to get to the semi-transparent aspect, which I love and is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. But let's just start with nature and the sea. Um, so why is nature one of the focus fo foci of, of your work? Yes, I mean, I think... Um... You won't find so many on my website, uh, but I started off do, right, uh, doing a lot of um, seascapes when I lived in Ireland and traveling around. And I think I always lived near water. I mean, even in Paris, I lived near the Seine. And I think I'm just attracted to uh, the colors, uh, but I'm not, um, I'm not a nature painter. I think it's more about man's relationship to nature. Mm -hmm. If you've seen that, yeah. that series, The Memory of Water. Which I'm going to show some from, yeah. Yeah, and so with that, that's as much about people as it is, not really about nature, it's more also about memory. And I like to, it's a challenge for me because those are quite large paintings. Uh, I learned oil painting, I learned watercolor, and those are oil paintings, but it's applying the techniques of watercolor, which has this transience um, and transparency to the medium of oil painting. So that's a challenge that I like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay, so, so since we're talking about the transparency, where did that sort of come from for you? Where did that idea or where did that, that impulse to, to integrate that as part of your, as part of the visual that you're creating, that, that idea of the transparency, where's that sort of coming from for you? Uh, you know, it's hard to pick apart ideas. It's just, I like when 
I admire watercolors. I admire things art or artworks which change as you look at them. So if you look also, if you read a novel, that is a work of art that is changing as you experience it. And I admire the transients of film, mm -hmm. the moment when you have one, um, one scene it fades away into the next. Mm -hmm. So I think it's in response to all of these things. Yeah. And there's other elements, motifs, that's hard to explain on a podcast, but if you're complementing with images, I had uh, trouble with my eyes when I was young. Uh, well, now they're, they're mostly good, but um, well, I would have these large sunspots and I, uh, um, they're very vividly colored floaters and uh, I get them sometimes now. And so you see that as a motif as well. I mm, need, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm interested in perception and vision and the, in those artworks. Um, okay, let me um, actually, now would be a good time to show Le Bleu, uh, that, the blue hour, because with this idea of movement and the idea that it's similar to some of what you see in the films, yes. because in Le Bleu, which I'm gonna, let me just show this for our listeners here. Mm -hmm. You have a woman who's walking and you see four images of her, but it's so it's almost as if it's time lapsed, or five images, I think. It's mm -hmm. almost as if it's time lapsed. Yeah. So that I think is a good example of the sort of thing you're talking about, right? With being inspired by by film and by that movement and. Yes, yeah. and I think it's also fascinating to me that we can have, and I don't know if it's alluded to in that painting, but I've done something that obsesses me. Uh, is the doubles or triples um, and you'll see that sometimes with my portraits of certain artists like I did uh, I interviewed Paul Oster and his most recently published novel quite a long one is 4321 which explores four distinct characters who whose lives it's like one person's life explored to four possibilities mm -hmm. so I don't know why it fascinates me, but it's this idea that we have our um, the self that we exist, the, the self that we are, and then we have our imagined lives. I, I don't know why it fascinates me, but it does interesting things on the visual plane. Well, there is the next the next painting I was going to show, and I don't know if this is coincidence mm -hmm. or if that's specifically related to, to this idea that mm -hmm. you're talking about, is for women. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show for women now for people. And sorry for those of you who are listening, but I'll give you the link to Mia's site afterwards. And of course, you can, it's miafunk.com, and you can, you can check out her beautiful, just mesmerizing work there. But mm -hmm. is this work for women specific, specifically sort of an outgrowth of what you were mentioning related to Paul Auster? Is that just kind of coincidental that we brought for that women, up? For women, I actually have to look because sometimes, which, which one is So, um, Oh, yeah, you don't have it. Yes. Well, I have it. It's just so small. You can't. Did, did you see it? Yes, I think yeah. I know which one. That's a, That's an. Oh, uh, I don't want to say it's an older work. I actually have to. Look. That's the one I was referring oh, to. Autumn. Yeah. Autumn. Oh, autumn. Oh no no sorry you're right it's autumn and I put in my notes no, no for women sorry yeah my fault. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah yeah. So that's another series because. That's why um, you didn't recognize it because I'm saying the wrong title. Sorry. <laughs> no it's okay. Yes I'm fond of that work. That's in a, a private collection in Paris and. Uh, Yes, I like the effects of light in that work, and thank you for because I I have a like a day and night series, and again, yes, you can see that they're related. It's almost like a choreography. Um, what 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 did you like about that work? And I have to bring it back up. Um, I I like the movement again. Mm -hmm. This one I find it intriguing that one thing I was going to bring up is first of all I was going to bring up the fact that in this series which again is Memory of Water. Is mm -hmm. this part of that? That's yes. part of the same one, right? That um, it's usually women. It's usually women in sundresses or sort of light dresses, not necessarily sundresses. Mm -hmm. You mostly can't see their faces. In mm -hmm. this one, we can see a bit of a profile, um, but there's movement. There's this, again, I just love the transparency because it, I don't know why I would have to mm -hmm. think about it. Again, it's more of a visceral reaction. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what the reason that I like that is, but I really do. Um, but then the next one I was going to show you, I can speak more to my reaction to, and when I say show you, I mean the people watching, yeah. and um, is Beneath the Ice. Oh, yes. You know this one, and mm -hmm. that's the right title this time, right? Yes. Not setting that you up for confusion. Yeah. <laughs> so this one, this one was interesting to me because comparing it to the others in the series, at least most of the others, it's... You know, so in the other ones, I'm watching them walk. I'm watching them from sort of somewhat removed and I'm watching their profiles and I don't feel as much, I feel a little more objective 
a little more in the position of an objective mm -hmm. observer. Whereas this one, and again, for those who are not looking at the picture, I'll just very briefly describe it. There's a woman in a sundress, her back to us, looking at this sort of Arctic or mountain alpine scenery with a lot of snow. Mm -hmm. And so I feel more, more identified with her and more because I'm sharing this experience more directly because I'm in, I'm almost... I'm seeing the same thing, seeing, seeing the same thing she's seeing mm -hmm. versus watching what she's doing, which of course I'm also doing because I'm still not there right next to her. But I felt, I feel more of, more in the scene than with the others. I'm not, I don't like it more or less, but I feel more sort of implicated. That's it. Yeah. So that's going, I guess, back to film and our formatting of uh, close on. And I think that you're, it's very perceptive that you notice that. I think that's something that when you have, uh, use a transparency where the, the edges, uh, because I, you've seen from my portraits, you know, have painted quite solid. When you're doing portraits, you have to often paint quite solidly, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that having that transparency allows you, I think, as you're observing, to enter within, under the skin, beneath right. the ice and under the skin. Right, maybe we'll right, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I like that you like that, and I want to do more in that series, uh, and I think, um, I would never define myself as an environmental artist, but I, definitely share those concerns mm -hmm. and I think that uh, I like to th think about what's happening to our planet and well and I would like to read a quote that I'd actually skipped over but now that you bring that back up again mm -hmm. I'm going to read this quote because I thought it was really beautiful and apropos that you made this connection so let me scroll back here um, but this was a Facebook post that you made related to Notre Dame oh, thank you. and you said quote after you talked about the catastrophe itself you said quote and in our prayers for her, her being Notre Dame, Our Lady, we might also pause to think of the other lady, of, of the other Our Lady, Mother Earth, who is also burning in slow motion while we stand by watching, too shocked to move. And I thought it was just very beautiful and thoughtful and appropriate that you would make that connection. And interestingly, I saw the Swedish environmentalist, whose name I'm not going to remember, who's been going around to all the different European political, I won't remember her name, but there's a 16-year-old Swedish woman who is an activist, and again, again, and she made a very similar connection today in the European Parliament, or some, some European government, and um, yeah, I just thought that that was a really sort of good connection and good parallel to make, and a, and a nice, nice reminder. For oh, all of us. You. So, yeah. Well, I uh, yes. I mean, and that's sad because I'd seen some people were... Uh, there was this general outpouring of sensitivity and some people were commenting, why don't we have the same kind of empathy for uh, human tragedies or hu the, the human stories? And I understand that too. But I, I ultimately... And because it's in my backyard, it's, you know, it's right next to where I live. So... I ultimately, that's to me is a case for how art can be used to highlight mm -hmm. other injustices because it brings it onto the human level. Because we can't, we can see these distant pictures of planet Earth, and those are all devastating. As we've seen what's happened, you know, you you, you time lapse or you you know fast forward ten years and right. think you know an ice cap is gone right. and just that right. kind of thing. But it's hard because it's so vast. Mm -hmm. And then what the arts, the humanities do and whatever whatever art form it is I they give you something that you can almost a book you can hold in your hand mm -hmm. that you can hold close to you something and by focusing on individual life or a group or a building like that you can concentrate on your mind on other important issues so it's very metaphorical on our humanity yeah I mean that's why we call them the humanities right yes which we lose sight of I think yeah. so often but I don't want to go too far from oh, yes, my next I'm, question I'm no no I brought that up I brought that up <laughs> I'm taking responsibility I'm not blaming you yes. but I want to I want to jump back before we move away from your painting uh -huh. something that I wanted to ask which mm -hmm. was um you know I'm seeing um well I'm just going to ask this here so when I published my novel one yes. question that I got that mm -hmm. you always hear other people getting asked mm -hmm. as well is is it autobiographical is it autobiographical is it autobiographical and my response inevitably was Anything that we produce, anything that we create, inevitably has a lot of ourselves in it. Mm -hmm. That's just part of the process. And then, of course, I didn't grow up in Spain. I didn't. I did live in this village, but much of it was pure fiction. Mm -hmm. But much of it, of course, I did draw on my own experiences. So I'm assuming that it would be the same when, although maybe not, given something you said a little while ago. But is it safe to assume that that's similar with the visual arts, with when you're painting? 
Well, I think the visual arts can, um, I don't know if the word document, can be the expression of a feeling, but it's not as biographical necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which again as, is something you were touching on earlier yeah. when you said you didn't have to be as emotional. I can't remember how you said yeah, it. Yeah, you, you can have, have a feeling, but a lot of technique comes into play, and so yeah. so it does with writing. And um, but in, unless it's like you're writing a historical fiction, a very research-based work, but you know, feelings-based work will always draw upon your experiences in some way. I yeah. mean, that's inevitable. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about portraiture also yes. uh, before we move on from your mm -hmm. painting. So portraiture is another big focus, and not just in the creative process exhibition, which we're going mm -hmm. to talk about those portraits, mm -hmm. um, but you also just in general. That's that's one of your areas of focus, mm -hmm. and you often choose or you have often chosen famous people. And so I'm just yes. going to cite uh, for subject matter. So uh, your audience series includes audiences full of famous people. There's the Jazz Masters. There's L'Audience, which has Picasso, Van Gogh, Dali. There's Sunset Boulevard, which has Elvis, Marilyn Monroe, James Dean. So there's these collections of people, important um, people from the past. And from, the, I should say, from the present. And from the present. Because I, w I would just say, like, I'm working on, uh, well, for the American Writers Museum, and also for, I'm working on an um, audience painting for, that will be for the Guildhall in the Hamptons, and also for the Ray Donovan show I'm doing. I've interviewed a number of people from the creative behind the scenes and actors, and that's an ongoing. Uh, we were talking about that the other night. I think about to New York, I'll be interviewing Alan Alda. Of course, I, anyway, that's a long engagement um, from the stars to um, um, more, um, not the star starring characters as well. So that's a, a big challenge for me uh, that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has been, when I didn't have the opportunity to interview or know um, some of those figures in the paintings that you're speaking of, like uh, for the Dublin Writers Museum, um, I actually, you know, was involved at the um, having set up the, the James Joyce Center and the um, and Robert Nicholson, the, the, the curator of the London <coughs> Writers Museum, wrote an introduction for the creative process. So I've known, I've been involved with the, the writing community in Ireland. However, I never met Oscar Wilde. I didn't have that chance. I would have right. loved to. Right. I would love to interview him. I would, I would an honor. But so I, of course, I, I put him in a painting to the next best thing I could do. Um, but when I have a chance to interview them, it's it's nice to be able to paint them. It's an honor. And uh, what's exciting for me, this latest one for the of the creative crew of um, Ray Donovan, is that it's I've never done it at all about one. It's usually been people from a, um, a field, mm -hmm. like writers or mm -hmm. artists generally, mm -hmm. but never just from like a show. Right. So I made you do more like that mm -hmm. because it makes you think and it, it also honors the different roles that they play. Yeah. Well, what do you like about portraiture specifically? Why is that one area that you were drawn to? Well, I've always been, I think that there were always, we're all fascinated in faces. Mm -hmm. I mean, what they tell us and they're like mirrors of ourself and, um, so you can say so much in that conscien concentrated space. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something that I can do and I like, I like doing it. I do like to do paintings that are anchored more in... I'm just talking about it's really hard when you're doing a podcast to uh, describe things that... I, I, you're going to augment with images, but um, I like with the, the audience, I guess you'll show that, um, being able to close up right on the face. So that's a kind of a filmic point of view. Uh, you have the eyes of everyone in the audience and they're usually more or less concentrated on the same spot. They're, mm -hmm. they're looking mm -hmm. at a screen or something on stage. And that's interesting because I think it relates back to, I think what was always fascinating is the creative process. They're imagining something, they're bringing it and you don't know what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. And I think it may have something to that. And why I like, Portraiture. I like people. I like yeah. stories. Yeah, like, and like yeah. you said, the face it, it tells so much. There's so many stories there. Yeah. The it sounds like the intimacy also. It's, it seems like it would be quite intimate. So it's interesting that you pr brought up the transparency and the turning away because I'll just read. I mean, I'm not going to read this whole story, but I wrote a story. It's a luxury to cry, and it begins this. She used to paint faces that stared out at you, but collectors found them too confrontational. Mm. When she turned away from this, her subjects did too, to look away, searching for something. And collectors liked these paintings better. They didn't know what the figures were looking for. That's what they liked about them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that's another issue um, that you have to deal with more with painting, is sometimes not to be too confrontational in when you're doing portraits. Interesting, yeah. I like it, but yeah, you have to be, I kind of, you, the eye, the direction of the eye is always very important. Interesting, painting, looking yeah. off, yeah. Um, that allows you to enter in their imaginative space or their feeling space. Uh-huh. Well, you know this anyway, the way, um, the way you, where you look, it, it indicates certain things, like if you're remembering something. Right. Uh, you're listening right. to something. Right. And they say if you look in a certain direction, you're lying. You're right. making things right. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting though that you take you need to take that into consideration. Obviously, when you're doing the portraits, mm -hmm. uh, one specific focus mm -hmm. within this focus of portraiture has been yeah. Francis Bacon and famous portraits. Francis yes. Bacon. You did quite a few, um, not necessarily just portraits. You did, I think you did some portraits, but then you've also done bigger works of, of which he's a part when he's coming into his studio. And know. I've also done a series of. British, I think that you mentioned that, um, the Aesthetica Prize, um, the, uh, a, a group with him and Lucien Freud that did an audience. Yeah. Him, so, yeah. And you've even, you even painted his art dealer, Bruno Sabatier. Yes. So what's the attraction there specifically to, to Francis Bacon as a, as a subject matter? Well, I, I admire his work. I think his face is interesting. His biography is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and going to interviews, the, the interviews he is given and he is, his way, he was very articulate, which is something you find in some great painters. You might not find it in other painters. Um, the violence of his imagery, the whole storyline. We don't have to. I mean, this, this uh, interview could take place. We just talked yeah. about Bacon. Yeah, it's a much bigger one. But yeah. his relationship with his um, lovers, models. Um, I mean, it's it's well known that um, he was kind of into S, not kind of. He was into SM. Yeah, and uh, all this. Is fascinating so I was interested in him and then the uh, one of the other great uh, British painters well I guess German British painters um, Lucien Freud mm -hmm. and I painted both of them in um, Lucien Freud more in a setting that was more like his studio Bacon in because Bacon painted in quite cramped surroundings so I mm -hmm. opened it out mm -hmm. and made it an imaginative space mm -hmm. But all that is, is really relating back to the creative process and the sort of a fascination with um, how people think, how things are made, um, how their, their personal lives finds its way into their art. And if you, if you showed some of those works, um, so let me, riffing on what they do. Yeah, yeah let me, I'm going to show one and then I'm going to read a quote from your website from someone who wrote an essay about this particular work. Oh, okay. And um, this, well, I'll say this after I show the work. So the work I'm going to show and which I'm showing now and again sorry to those of you who are listening but again miafunk.com you need to check these out um, the, the the piece I'm showing right now is Theater of Panic and so again that's the right title yeah Theater of Panic Bacon is entering his studio mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot going on and I won't try to describe it because it's it's beyond my capacity to describe very quickly here but he's entering his studio there are two models that are that are um, um, posing basically and he's already started this poem behind or this painting behind them a lot is going on so now I'm gonna read this quote um, which is relative I think to this series which is very different also from the memory of water series yes. very different mm -hmm. so on your website inside the artist studio is this series called inside the artist studio or was that yes. just the name okay I couldn't tell if that was just the name of the essay or the series or both okay inside the artist studio essay by professor Patrick Healy quote funk is created from the ground up a, uh, a direct means of storytelling. On the other side of this immediacy is an intricate, even witty, matrix of menace, where what initially might seem an homage to great artistic, homage to great artistic personalities, Bacon and Freud, contains elements of morbid sensitivity, demonic decay, and atmospheres of surreal mutation, which all underscore the layered reference and pointed compositions by which she communicates as much horror as the light. So that was quite an intense and that, and when you're looking at this work, that all makes sense. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to, to some of that as much horror as delight and um, matrix of menace, morbid sensitivity, demonic decay. It seems like is that that's largely inspired perhaps by Bacon, but then well, you just, you just speak to, um, to kind of your thoughts on that. Well, um, there's a lot morbid, there. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot. I like, <laughs> but this is also fascinating. Uh, I'm really interested in collaboration. And so it's fascinating when you show an artwork, you bring it out to the world. You, I think it takes a certain amount of courage. I've never had uh, like a difficulty with that, but it's fascinating because people have different interpretations. Now, I 
I agree with what he says. I'm not sure if I would phrase it so elegantly, yeah. but uh, I like how a visual artwork could inspire what I consider that's a, a linguistic art. It was an essay, it was creative. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and then someone else could look at a painting and they would see something else entirely, although that's pretty specific. I think it would be hard to find different interpretations of that. Um, I think you're right, it is a break from the memory of water, although I did that painting before a lot of the memory of water paintings which you've seen. Uh, I think that that's more, let's say, in storytelling and in my own writing, I like to explore some of those themes. It's sometimes hard to explore in painting, which is a decorative well, it's often considered a decorative medium, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get that closer. Or people say collectors might not necessarily, they'll be fascinated by them, maybe more in Germany or something. They would like all of this kind of complication. Um, but it's not, it's for them to put on their wall, it's, it's, too, it's too bizarre, you know? Um, and no, I just, I did want to explore that. And going into, and I'll bring Lucian Freud into it as well, that he also had um, complicated relationships with his many models. I mean, I think it was, he's on the record of saying it, and I'm not sure, I think it's pretty true that he had uh, 30 illegitimate children. Legitimate I saw this, I saw 40, and 40? 14, 14 had been confirmed. Okay, so I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to... <laughs> a lot. Let's just, to a lot. be, yes, yeah. quite, quite a few. <laughs> so that thing that the artists, model, the muse. Um, in fact, a, a friend of mine has, has written a book of this, it's to be translated soon into English, about um, Corbein and Whistler and um, uh, their mutual model, Joanna Heffernan, who is, the, this, they say, the, the origin du monde, you know, the painting by Corbein, they mm. say that is her. So this, mm, this whole interplay um, about what inspires the creative process is fascinating to me. And I liked, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, or the challenge of t exploring that dramatically through painting. Mm -hmm. So tell me, getting a little more specific about process, mm -hmm. which again, obviously we've been talking about, but when you, when you say to yourself, for example, and you can approach this however you want, because this is gonna be a very open-ended question, but I'm just always curious how people respond. Mm -hmm. You know, when people will say, what is your process? So let's say you're going to start with, you're going to start a new series or even you're starting a new a new painting or of course it could be an essay or a story. Mm -hmm. What are just some general sort of high level aspects of your process? That you, And like I said, you can kind of approach this however you want. And I can also help you with some quotes, but I'm curious just your initial reaction. Well, quotes about things you know I've said in the past? No, about no, your fine. process, oh, yeah. You know, people said this? Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I think that the thing that most people in the, well, this depends. So if you're working in film or TV, then you really have to be more, mm, have to go about it in a different way. But I think with writers or painters, um, less time sensitive, less collaborative um, artists will almost like to encourage a kind of dreaming where they're not conscious of their process mm -hmm. so much. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't, that's, that's the way I approach it. Mm -hmm. But there's certain, when you're structuring a painting, there's certain things that you, just know everyone knows like the golden mean or the arrangement of this you'll, you'll you'll place people in a certain way because that will be the focal point of the painting those right. are things certain you always structural. have yeah structural and that's with a uh, novel or anything yeah um but with uh, short fiction um uh, i think i and a lot of people like to work this way um they allow it to bubble up in their unconscious mm -hmm. and uh, and in that and if i would speak to that um Although some people don't like this distinction distinction between the unconscious mind and the the logical mind, like the, but but I, I let's call it the unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel that that often is more powerful than this logical plotted mind. So we mm -hmm. have to do everything that we can to be uh, unaware of what we're doing, mm -hmm. and that uh, for me I access that by working really quickly. Mm, because, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if, and you know, of course it's very different because if you're writing a novel, you know, you do have to plot things. You have to say, oh, well, that has to come in. But I, a lot of people I know, even if they're plotting, they're doing a lot of this kind of writing just to get it out and then they just right. slot it in the right areas. Right. And that produces work, I feel, mm -hmm. which is more surprising. Getting you know? the rational mind out of the way and just letting it flow. Sure, because then the people don't, 
you know, if you're writing about characters, even though you have to have a plot, they don't, people don't behave logically most right. of the time. No, they don't. They definitely don't. <laughs> um, but I yeah. would like to speak about that in terms of, uh, yeah, by, I, I write in very um, concentrated bursts. Mm -hmm. And this is something, but everyone has different ways, but I'll actually time myself. Uh, like what, how do you time three what? minutes? You'll make yourself do something within a three minute window. Yeah, right. Very, uh -huh. very quickly. Yeah. Interesting. And and Interesting. also with art. Yeah. Very, very quickly. You'll time your paintings? Or uh, time no, no, a time, part of the painting? Time or disappears how? composition wise, yeah. Mm -hmm. and very composition, okay. And and yeah, and you can get a lot of writing done in those periods. I, I shouldn't say that, but you can really get um what you want to say, the essence of what you, what you want to say out three, five, ten minutes. That's, I like that. That's very interesting. Okay, I'm going to also read a quote mm -hmm. that touches on a lot of what you just said, because I do, I do like citing these quotes, especially when they're good quotes. Okay, yeah. so you say, quote, when I am obsessed with something, I tend to reflect that obsession at every turn, be it memory, the perversity, isolation, complexity of the human condition, or whatever the concept or theme that's on my mind at that particular time. I try to be provocative and playful and create a visually impacting work using oil on canvas, moving the paint like a dream nightmare until I'm satisfied with the effect of the images coming through. So I loved that. And I think that speaks to something about this idea of just going into another space that's hopefully not so rational, not encumbered by the rational mind and just going into this dreamlike, and I mean, that's maybe going further than you meant by this, but moving the paint like a dream nightmare. I really, I liked how you said that. Thank you. I and, hope, yes. And I think that's, does that kind of speak to what you're talking about and so far as just letting it happen and not overthinking mm. it? Yes. Yeah. Um, the other thing, or not the other, another thing you said is, I think people have a capacity now to accept strange, and I hope some of my work holds up to that. Yes. I want to disorient the viewer and make the unfamiliar familiar. Thoughts on that? Uh... I think that's, I'm speaking, well, I, I'm, I'm there, I believe I was, might have been talking about inside the artist studio, but, yeah, um, but I think it also applies to the memory of water, and that's very familiar things, landscapes you might know, the sea, the mountain, but, you know, there are two figures, there's a double, there's something disorientating and disembodied, perhaps, um, yes, I, yes, yeah, so that maybe you look at something again, um, so you saw it for the first time. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you, I think we've already covered this, but I'm going to ask you just in case mm -hmm. there's anything else you want to s say on this subject, and maybe, maybe there isn't. But we talked about how different Memory of Water is from Inside the Studio. Is that the yes. right title? Inside. Inside the yes, but that Inside. was a br br brief period. I might okay. do some more about that. It's not my... Memory of Water is my consistent audience you, paintings and yeah, portraits. Yeah. Yeah. But point being, just comparing how different they are, I was just going to ask, you know, how experimentation and exploration and doing really different things fits into your process. Yeah, um, I think in terms of writing or painting, it's about um, introducing maybe the, that, that's personal work. So introducing an unexpected element or like a Dada thing, where I let's see if how I can introduce this and and make it something, you know, do a story about it. Yeah, and then. So that um, improvisation is very important to mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really how you'll surprise your audiences, no matter what your discipline is. And then on another level that relates to it, having these conversations with, I mean, having the, and that's honor of having these conversations for really, you know, leaders and their, their field. And that allows me to expand my knowledge. And then I have to think about, because I, I, I don't like to just passively absorb information. I like to... That's the only way that I learn is really by making something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think this is true of a lot of people mm -hmm. that, you know, you can read a book, but if you didn't somehow absorb it into your creative process, you'll forget it. Yeah. So I like the challenge of then doing an exhibition and then doing a portrait that is a response to their work. Mm -hmm. What I've learned from the conversation we had. And um, and often we, uh, we will go on to maybe collaborate or participate in other things. Yeah. And, so let's talk about the creative process exhibition. Yeah. So we're naturally obviously transitioning into that, which mm -hmm. is perfect because that's uh, that's where I am over here as well in my cheat sheet. So, <laughs> Sorry, so let's, no, no, it's perfect. So, but in a nutshell, let's take a step back though, yeah. again, and not assume that people know what mm -hmm. the creative process exhibition is. So just at a high level sort of marketing blurb, what 
and again, we're going to go much deeper, obviously, but what is the Creative Process Exhibition for people who might not already be familiar with it? I should probably give some of my background, too. Okay. Um, I've been working with um, literary museums and culture centers for over 20 years. So as you mentioned, I did the portraits for the Dublin Writers Museum, and I've been involved in different things like this for a long time. I was, in, I was doing documentaries. Uh, so this is something I came back to a few years ago when I was... Uh, doing the research for the portraits for the American Writers Museum and I interviewed a number of American writers and as we discussed their influences or what interested them, you know, I would find out, oh, well, they didn't start off as a writer. You, you find this a lot in your conversations. Oh, I started off as a geophysical engineer and, or, um, yeah, I, I studied physics or I, medicine and then, or they're fascinated not just in American writing, but, you know, international writers and art uh, all sorts of disciplines yep. so then I, I found there was a need for a parallel international project that also because I'm international I, I live primarily in Paris and, and travel for this exhibition uh, that would engage with students because as I, I guest lecture at different universities I found a huge curiosity among students of you know, they're beginning, or, or just, you know, writers who want to, or you know, people are beginning in their art form and they, they just don't know. They ask, how do you do it? And mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, oh, I can share this. I have these, these friendships, I have this network. And so out of this grew this traveling exhibition, which debuted at the Sorbonne and is traveling around leading universities, but I should say also culture centers and selected museums. Um, and I uh, do these interviews, sometimes with the participation of students, because it's an educational initiative. So they really enjoy getting the chance to meet someone that um, they really admired at a distance. And yeah. now we're doing podcasts and things like that. Yeah. Um, and they get a, we have different collaborating curators, and students are involved in that. Different aspects of mm -hmm. design, and so uh, it's a multi. So anyway, I guide a lot of the interviews. Principally, I've done most of them. And then I respond creatively because this is what I try to pass on to participating students is that, as I said, not just to absorb information passively, but what are you going to do with it? What, you know, how is that you've, you know, this, they've given so much, they've given their time and their insights, but mm -hmm. I can learn from it. What can I do? Yeah. So I do portraits then inspired by those conversations. That's the core of the exhibition. And we have projection elements, which now comprise, um, creative works by um, people from over 50 countries. Mm -hmm. So our principal language is English, but then we have works in, in other languages, some short films, visual art, and um, I should say, and I, that's a really big mouthful, so I guess people will have to you know, visit the website or one of the exhibitions. Creativeprocess.info? Yeah, right. it, it gives more of the visualization. Because as you know, because with your with your uh, podcasts and with your different projects, things evolve. So in the beginning, it was a lot of interviews with primarily writers, but some film directors and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I found that when it's traveling to different areas and we work with different universities, they're suggesting people, and that I I I hadn't even thought of creativity in that broad way. They would suggest like a Nobel Prize winning physicist who, right. you know, um, actually from near use, uh, Saul Pulmetter, uh, who, Pulmetter, who um, teaches at UC Berkeley. He's currently in Paris. So, mm -hmm. um, so and he, he teaches a great course there about, he's also a classical violinist. Mm -hmm. So the boundaries of creativity have been, I had to say, what I evolved thought of it. Yeah, it really expanded. evolved. And yeah, sorry, I've uh, kind of rambling here, but um, so it's just so it's very fascinating. I, I love learning and just passing that on to, to yeah. students. So it sounds mm -hmm. like one of my questions was going to be, and you've kind of touched on this, but I was going to ask you, you know, how do you choose the people that you interview, right? Uh -huh. And it sounds as if, I mean, some of it must just be your own curiosity. You're yes, curious course, about a particular yeah. author, uh -huh. but then it sounds but as if just, authors, what, what, just <laughs> for example, that's just an example, right? It's it's authors, it's musicians, it's artists, it's physicists, like we just said. Um, but then you're saying, as you'll have a conversation with one person, maybe they recommend someone else, and it sort of organically sort yeah. of expands. I'm it sure you like. found the same way. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did have. I mean, yeah, I have a my own curated list, but I, I'm listening. And so, uh, as we presented at that event at Link Litwings, uh, I just recently came back from Athens, and that was a, just a wonderful opportunity. And it involved 
interviews with museum curators and directors and the choreographer for the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games and composers. Right. So yeah, that was a, a collaboration of some people I had selected myself that I knew had to be in the because you have to include the director of certain, the Acropolis Museum. Sure, sure. If you're certain doing people something, are just a given. Yeah, so if speak, you're, yeah. But you're doing something about Greece and you're celebrating ancient Greece up to the contemporary, you should talk to the Acropolis One could argue, Museum. yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that, but there were others that I, I didn't know and that, and I'm always happy to learn about that because we, if, as I'm coming and I, I don't have a, a deep connection to Greece with our friends mm -hmm. there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't I would have these kind of standard international choices and right. I would say well look at this very interesting graphic novelist and I'd say wow and then right. he's done this book that is I mean I could link to different right. things lots but of different yes. examples right That's so, so quick sort of nitty-gritty question here so you you have all these you do all these interviews yes. and um, and then you create the portraits as a result which I'm gonna ask a couple more things about those portraits sure. but um, just so again so people who aren't familiar with this understand exactly how it works so you take excerpts from those interviews and you put them on the website yes um, not everything is on our website. not everything yeah. is on the yeah. website so that's one of my questions is it sounds like the full interviews get published in different academic institutions primarily or different academic uh, journals yeah. How did the interviews get disseminated? Because parts on your website, but not everything. So how, yeah. tell us yeah, a little bit about that. It takes time to add things and transcribe, as you know. But so, so is that is that primarily the issue? I didn't know if that was deliberate or if it's just a question of. Oh, also, it's just you have to go on to do new interviews. So now we're doing. Yep. We found the podcasting is a faster way to do uh -huh. it instead of. Oh, that. interesting. Okay. It wasn't because I didn't. I like the printed, and we do. You know, we, we have that that version, and that goes into the archives. Uh, we have like a special hand illustrated folio edition that's unique for each. Um, university or cultural center that goes in their archives. That, that's the right, for each exhibition that's visited there. Yeah, yeah. that's that. Yeah. That, we, that can be read there. And also online that we share interviews and uh, some print publications from the, the journals, different from the journals. Different, yeah. Right, right. And so, um, and now we're doing the podcasting. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, a, that's a new thing. Um, so I'm selfishly curious. Um, you're <laughs> yes. doing all of these interviews. And now I've been doing these interviews for kind of a year. I oh. you know, took a little time off. Basically, a year I've been doing these interviews. So what? Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your approach when you sit down with the head of the Acropolis Museum or, or just in general, when you're, when you're going to interview someone, just tell me a little bit about how you approach an interview. Oh well, I'm this. This was a, this was different for me to sit down here uh -huh, because you're on you, the wrong side. You're no, on the other side. No, I mean, no, yeah. I am. Um, no, I mean I've been interviewed. That's different. Yeah. I don't. Uh, I prepare a lot. I'll read uh, if, if they're writer. I read or their work, or s read other interviews. Of course, you do that right. to see, right. uh, and then you'll or watching their films or their theater or their you know listening to their music. I mean that's that's normal. Uh, to do as much research as possible sure. and then what's what's also interesting because if we have com friends in common or we are actually friends then you have this other angle where you know people have collaborated with them so you you look into that uh, but I memorize most of my questions so I brought really? this here I know I don't look at it I don't yeah, interesting you memorize most of your questions not that I memorize you're way it. ahead of me no, I don't <laughs> I am I am helpless without my 10 pages of notes. That's impressive. No, yeah. but I'll do it. But I don't like to look down at them. Yeah. So I have this thing I brought. Okay, maybe I don't want to have some pithy remarks. But um, when you're interviewing me, but I no, I don't. So I'll, I'll have it there. Initially, I wouldn't do anything. But sometimes when the subject is very serious, or like say, you know, it's a STEM or something, then I'll have that there on my tablet just to look at if I need to, which yeah. is also kind of prop. But I just never look down because yeah. I have... Um, such bad myopia <laughs> that if uh -huh. I look down, I'm not going to. You can't see it. <laughs> yeah, that's, <a> <laughs> that's different. That's different. I thought you were just had this lofty, no, you know, no, no, belief that I shouldn't do that, and you're telling me you're nearsighted and you can't see it. No, no, no. It's, no it's actually true. I do <laughs> yeah, believe it because it's both. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, want to. Yeah. Um, and that can work against you. Sometimes things don't go right. Yeah. But I feel that basically you can. Mem I'm gonna have a pretty good memory when yeah. I need to. So. Yeah it comes out better for mm -hmm, me that mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm. But I tried to teach that to some students and I think that they really like the notes. So it's it's all your own style. But I do feel like, you know when you're, I guess it's not acting, but if you're acting and you saw someone looking down at the script, like that would take you out of it. <laughs> it would take you out of it. That's a little different. I, uh, that's, I mean, this is a performance. I'll agree with you in that sense. But no, but no, for me, good. for example, normally, you know, because I'm normally doing this live and it has yeah, to be an hour. I to me, 
I, I try, I plan things much more than if we were having an offline conversation that I could just be much more organic, then I wouldn't need that to have this sense. kind of notes. Although yeah. I might still cheat once in a while because I do like to bring in quotes sometimes. No, it's like good that, to bring which in quotes. Yeah. And, and then but, people will read, if they're like a writer or something, they may have read a passage. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit more about the, the portraits that you do and why, because I think it's a really interesting. First of all, I'm, I'm curious how the hell you managed to do portraits of all of it. Because you've interviewed how many people? Do you know? Um, a couple I hundred did. or something? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Right. Yeah, yeah. right. How do you, first of all, just practically, how do you manage to do all these portraits? One. But two, where did that idea come from? You Come uh, to, come, let me rephrase this. How did that idea and where did that idea come from to you? I don't think I'm getting the sentence out. It's okay. To do that, you know? You I think it's really should. interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will, I, for me, as I said, I like to learn. I have to make something to learn. I don't know. It will pass mm -hmm. out of my long-term memory if I don't. So I think it, because I am a visual artist, that it made sense that I did the portraits. It was sort of an organic way of synthesizing. I know I'm putting words into your mouth, but is it sort of an organic way of synthesizing what, you, what you've what you just, the, the exchange that you've just had? Yeah, sounds I think like? so. It's a kind of collaboration, although yeah. people might not term it that. And though we have I've gone on to collaborate on different things. You yeah, know? yeah. Didn't, like, so... And then I'm not really, a, I'm not a photographer, but in an exhibition you need to, it needs to have visual content. Mm -hmm. So I would have to do an artwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I could use other people's Pictures portraits. or Yeah, but other, it would just yeah, seem, yeah. I, it just, that didn't seem right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. So. Yeah, yeah. But isn't it difficult? I mean, just from a practical standpoint to produce, or are you just that prolific that you just have a rhythm and you're able to, to keep up? Um... Yeah, but I have a I have a backlog of some. Yeah, <laughs> I have to okay, do it from all right. New York okay, as well. that's what I, I have to do. It. No, but then I yeah. have to do them very quickly, and that works out. Um, yeah, and to your process so, that we talked about earlier. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah it's on. I, it's, you fit it in somehow. Is there any trepidation to doing a portrait of someone and then giving them the portrait? Because we talked about earlier doing portraits of people you don't even know, and how um, there's still this idea that can be they can't complain. Great. <laughs> uh, which which makes it a little easier, less pressure. But then you talked about even just the eyes can't be too direct. So and things like that, right? So now if you're doing a portrait of someone you've just interviewed, is there any trepidation in giving them the work and and how it's received by them? Because again, it is sort of personal, right? And you are yeah. sort of showing them how you've seen them, and we're all we all have different feelings and stuff about how we're perceived. Or are they normally just so honored it's not really an issue? I wouldn't. I've actually had very. Um, good responses. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say they're so honored because I mean, you know, they've had their portraits done in different ways, but I think that these are a little bit. I try to make them imaginative. Sometimes they're uh -huh. straightforward. Um, uh -huh. No, I, I don't experience a trepidation. I've got very nice letters, and, and as I said, if we go on to, to collaborate or do things like that, that's yeah. a sign that right. they like that they liked it. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, but I am going to read a quote. I'm going to play someone that. who didn't like it. Uh, well, no, but you said something that was interesting. You said something that was really interesting yeah. along these lines. So this was from your um, Tobias Wolf interview. Uh -huh. You said, uh, but readers of Wolf also know there is an edge of danger to many of his books. And during his early years, he was often uprooted. So as a companion to this, I am now working on another artwork, which reflects a bit of the wildness and changing perspectives of old school, the barracks, the, uh, the boy's life and many other short stories. If the picture is successful, I will be sharing it on this site in the upcoming months. So if this picture is successful, so I thought that was interesting. How do you know a picture is or is not successful? I don't know. It just, and sometimes I have to share things if they're not uh -huh. ready yet. Uh -huh. um, I, I think that's just, just your eyes just know it, uh -huh. um, but maybe you would be a more strict judge than others. Uh, I just, that's interesting thing in, in terms of comparing to a, a narrative, a long narrative, where you could have a <coughs> sentence out of place, you could have like a whole chapter out of place, but the whole thing would work. You yeah. know, there was just yeah, something the, wrong. The, the un, yeah, the, yeah the but work, sometimes, yeah. you know, if you have something wrong in a, in a painting or... You can't erase it and go back, basically. No, you, you can. I mean, sometimes but you can, just, you can paint over but and But it's things, just but, you can't yeah. spoil the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's it. You you just know. Yeah, I don't know it's just again know. a visceral sort of gut intuitive thing. Well, you must know when you look at artwork, you, you see things that are. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I certainly. But it's different if you're the artist, which is what I was curious about, right? If you've produced this work and then you see it and you're like, it's not, it's not there for me. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Anyway, okay. So let's talk about. Um, 
a different angle of this that we oh, haven't, I think sure. again, we probably, I'm sure we probably mentioned it, but I just want to make sure that this is highlighted because I think it's a really important part of the exhibition, which mm -hmm. is that um, people can submit. Yes. That this is a really big part of it. It's not just the interviews. That's the crux of it, and that's sort of where it started. Mm -hmm. But you've expanded so that other people can 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 contribute to the exhibition. So can mm -hmm. you talk about these couple of different ways that that people can do that? Oh yes. Well, they can send directly to the submissions at creativeprocess.info, uh, or it's also done through the collaborating universities or. Um, but what sorts of things curators. would they submit? Just to give them a kind oh, of specific. Oh, sure. It's the. Yeah. Uh, it's the creative works in general so that could be even well a personal or an academic essay which we, you might not consider but we we, we publish on our website they're quite long uh, we can include an, a very short excerpt in our projection elements um, because you can't read a whole 20 page academic essay right. <laughs> in right. an exhibition uh, but visual artwork from you know photography drawing you know, painting uh, in terms of incorporating we have um, we included short films. Uh, sometimes we'll just include the stills, and then we'll uh, sometimes pair artworks with uh, you uh, your writing has been in the travel vignette series curated by Aaron Byrne. Yep. Um, the the writer, filmmaker, travel writer, um, yep. uh, which we're we're honored by uh, to include. The, it's a very fascinating selection of travel writing also sometimes on the border of fiction and oh goodness, uh, yeah. beautiful selection of uh, photography mm -hmm. um, from from all over the world so it, it's it's various poetry prose it yeah. sounds as if initially though the focus was and I'm not sure that if this is still the case so I'm yeah. curious it sounds as if initially those the submissions were the intention was that they'd be somehow related to the interviews or somehow related to at least the themes brought up in the interviews yeah is that still sort of the case that. yeah we've expanded it i mean and because sometimes that's limiting mm -hmm. but i find that the submissions always do relate in some way um and you'll see on uh, we uh, it's hard to say but you'll see in the sidebar next to some interviews pieces that were submitted as a part of uh some of our um, writing programs in schools right. like um, like we have an inner city after school writing um, program and open mic events and so those have sometimes been related to prompts uh, you know think about this story and and they sent us some wonderful pieces which were very different but related um, you know uh, in powerful ways and and also brought in like a whole hip-hop element because we're working mm -hmm, with inner city mm -hmm. cool um, cool yeah, it, do, it doesn't have to be so strictly linked, right. but as it's curated and arranged in the projection elements, um, it, it has a sort of thematic right. so linkage. The, yeah. Right, right. So students can contribute. It's a great way of them to get published, maybe even for the first time, and it's mm -hmm. a great way. You, you've mentioned multiple times this idea of it being an interaction of if I, I read this interview and then something hopefully I will be inspired and something will come of it. Yeah. And so it can be this, again, this interactive... Uh, exchange and a lot of these students maybe haven't published anything before I'm suspecting yes also, right? sometimes and sometimes they've actually been students sometimes uh, their professor is one of the right it can be any level of student right from yeah. child to PhD right? yeah oh yeah. yeah that's um, yeah. Uh, so that's what I like too you know um, but that doesn't mean they're not I mean I was talking about our inner city uh, program uh, which has been endorsed by Noam Chomsky he's seen it in the classrooms um, that they're powerful writers, even though they haven't been published. Oh, because sure. they, oh. some of their life experiences yeah. <laughs> are like really, <laughs> right. um, you just can't, you can't make that stuff up. And they're yeah. not writing just to, oh, just to show that they can write, you know, because they're they, might, expressing they something. might have lost their parents. There right. may be immigrants who've gone through hell just to get, like I'm talking about a uh, sure. program in America. Sure. So um, just, you know, their daily life is so tough so they're they're searching for beauty in different ways and so I've, I've been very moved um, by their submissions but sometimes it was tough though reading them I mean that I you know sometimes I would just cry sure because, um, and so we try to you know um, I don't have to think about it but so that those are sometimes essays that they write and be adapted for their college mm -hmm. um, applications oh, uh -huh. yeah. oh great great um because i think it's important for a lot of people whether whether they have very, very difficult life experiences like that or just to know that they're heard mm -hmm. and to know that 
you know, just go on. Here, here's, here's some other, it could be a writer who's gone through similar experiences, who had very tough experiences, and look, look, they ended up winning a Pulitzer right. Prize. Or, right. you know, it's not that, it's just they have something to, to, to reach for. I think that's very important. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that you're helping to get the, the word out mm -hmm. about this and mm -hmm. those opportunities mm -hmm. make them more visible to mm -hmm. people who might not already know about them. You mm -hmm. mentioned that the show was recently, in, or the exhibition was recently in Athens. Yeah, that was a preview, yes. Right. The Byzantine, yes. Okay, and we mentioned, because you're going back, and we mentioned yeah. that the show is, or the... Um, the, uh, the exhibition is going to 40 leading universities and cultural centers. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, because that must be extremely involved, right? Taking something on the road to 40 different institutions. And mm -hmm. you said that each, first of all, I'm curious how you would design a show to be that mobile. Mm -hmm. Because particularly in addition, you've said that you tailor each show to the particular destination. Can you speak to that a little bit more? You sort of alluded to that with regards to Athens, but can you speak to that a little yeah, more? Yes, so I realized, uh, we realized yeah. early on that, because it's supposed to be international, that you should not be giving the same content mm -hmm. to everyone. You want to celebrate the local creative contributions. So why send a bunch of, you know, Anglophone content to them, you know? Uh, you celebrate what they've contributed alongside some of these international voices. Uh, so it's designed to be very portable, the exhibition, mm -hmm. for that very reason, because it's a lot of content. Yeah. Um, so there, um, the exhibition can be shown at any time uh, because it's a it's a unique uh, folio edition on you know on archival paper that can be displayed on walls or framed. This kind of thing um, that can be shown in libraries and in the um, exhibition spaces at mm -hmm. universities and then it's adaptable so we're going to do something different at the Palobolus we're still working it out at Palobolus is um, five census festival um, that's in Connecticut Waterford Connecticut July August and so that's an that's another challenge because Palobolus is this I don't know if you know they're mm -hmm. um, this wonderful um, dance company mm. and so I interviewed Itamar Kubovi. This is a kind of example of like interviews turned into other kind of collaborations yep. and you may have seen their work because um, a few years back they uh, did the choreography for the Oscars and you've probably seen different campaigns they've done even if you haven't Didn't seen their realize. dance pieces. Sure, yeah. yeah they have a they've just had a uh, been showing in Berlin Sh Shadowlands which is silhouettes of the dancers you see them projected like shadows mm -hmm. and it's very um fascinating it goes back to like our i think our earliest engagement with um i don't know shapes you know as a child mm -hmm. you would see you'd make shadow puppets and things but plato's it, cave yeah plato's cave mm -hmm. exactly so um, so we show their their five senses festival at some Waterford, connecticut that's a so that different must, that's outside yeah yeah and that must really keep it interesting for you that it's different at each place. Well, not that it's not already interesting for you, but I mean that just that's such such a fresh injection of 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 just different aspects each time you're going to a place and you're engaging with the local the local mm -hmm. organizations, creators on these. I mean, it also sounds like it's a tremendous amount of work at the same <laughs> it's, time. It's a lot of work, but I I think it's important, and then I, I think that. Well, you know yourself when you're going to different countries. Um, I think that um, originality comes about through challenges, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you can predict everything, then you're maybe not getting your best work. Sure. Um, so I'm excited to see what happens with the Five Senses Festival, which is one of, they bring in um, artists from different disciplines, not just dance. Yeah. And to see, I'm not sure how we're going to do some projection thing and some workshops, we're still working it out. Uh, they have this kind of, they have a grotto and they have this great like stone um, sculptures. Do you know Marcia de Sanctis? No, you're not. I, we never met. Oh, I know. she yeah, was read last night. Yeah, yeah. So she her was husband read, yeah. did this, yeah. these kind of stone sculptures and I think so we have a project against that. So that's, that's fascinating again because you can't control, it's not a gallery space. Right. So you're you're doing so much. I'm curious. I was going to ask you this earlier, and we we moved on to to other stuff. But this is making me wonder again. So the Sorbonne is where you started. Does the Sorbonne support you still, or is that just where you started? Because it's not, there's a big years. organization oh. underneath here, right? <laughs> Supporting all this, right? You've got advisory councils in Asia, Europe, the states. What's sort of the background or the backbone that, that's keeping you going? 
No. <laughs> well, I know that you're the the day to day backbone that's keeping this going, and you're the you're the brain behind this with the lots of other brains that are helping yes, you. Yes, I'm very honored. But but so it's not. I'm just curious. This is such a massive undertaking. You've got such a such a scope and depth and breadth to this. So it's not. I didn't know if it was the Sorbonne supports you day in day out. That you're saying no. that's just where it started. Yeah, that's where we debuted because where I, I live. Yeah. And so yeah. Um, no, it's that. I mean, we're still. I'm still collaborating with um, students and some faculty from the Sorbonne, and mm-hmm. they're they're um, collaborating curators, uh, working on some podcasts, um, and different things. Uh, no, and just we have this. Uh, we're fortunate to have the support of different universities who show it in their venues. Mm-hmm. And, and that way, um, yeah, but it's just a, a general um, interested uh, network of faculty and students who, and, and artists and creatives in different fields yeah. who, who like to share their knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, and, and like you have, to learn. Yeah. And you have volunteers also, I think, who help you with different things, volunteers, right? Volunteers, yeah, yeah. We, have, we have sustaining finance from the foundation, yeah, Mishowski. Okay. And, mm-hmm. um, yes. Yeah, That's great. Switzerland, yeah. So what's the um, sort of, so we're, we're way over on time. So I'm just um, going to... Yeah, I've been talking too much. No, to say you haven't been talking too much. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I, I have one question before we before we wrap yeah. things up, which is just sort of the long-term vision for the uh, for the exhibition, because it could go on and on and on and on. It's almost, to me, it almost seems as if you're creating this museum, right? This, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so is there some sort of long-term vision or are you just moving forward and seeing how it organically evolves? Where, where would it be in 10 years or 20 years from now, for example? I would hope, I, I actually would always like to be involved. I had a, at the beginning, of, oh, it was, as we mentioned, it was involved with um, primarily writers and directors, but then as there are other opportunities to include these different disciplines, it's yeah. grown, as yeah. you say. Uh, I had a, like a five-year plan, and it may overstretch that. And then at that stage, I should probably get back to more of just my own artwork right. and writing. And and says we have these groups of people involved that they could take carry the torch. Yeah. On after the. Um, but I I I would like it to to continue because there every year we have new voices that are right. added, and right. and I'm not the only one involved in like celebrating creativity. Um, but I feel. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm. It's interesting that you say it's a traveling museum. Yeah. 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 That's. I mean, you're just adding to the collection, and uh-huh. it's getting bigger and more diverse, and branching yeah. into subject matter and disciplines, like you said, that you hadn't even anticipated. So it's really taking on a life of its own. It sounds like, except for that you're at the center, making sure it keeps breathing. <laughs> well, but yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that we have to adapt now to say. I'm um, something I, I say often is that the nature of learning is changing, and mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. I I feel honored that if I have these conversations with these uh, creative thinkers I can pass that uh, knowledge on in uh, innovative ways yeah yeah um, so for in a, going back to a practical question here so where uh, for people who are listening and watching where can they check out the other than online creativeprocess.info where will they be able to check it out the, the next physical exhibitions which institutions is it headed to next well, yeah, they should just check it out online. We have uh, regular updates. I mentioned that we're doing something with Palovas Five Senses. And that's the next one. Yes. And, well, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm You're missing. going back to Greece, I think. Yes, we're going back to Greece. Also, I'm um, going for just for a brief thing, just in the Hamptons, we're um, um, previewing there some of our projection elements. And then I'll go back for a fuller um, projection you know, um, outdoors on buildings and yeah. things like that. Yeah. All right, there is so much to check out. This is such Uh, an impressive endeavor, and it's so inspiring. And I can't wait, and I can't recommend enough to those of you listening and watching to to, to actually go to creativeprocess.info and check out all the interviews. Again, they're not all there. They're not all complete. But what is there is just so, there's just so much there. Mm -hmm. And um, I obviously looked at a lot of them before today, but I can't wait. Wonderful research. Thank you. You Yeah, well, you made it so easy because there's so much great stuff out there. But but I sincerely am looking forward to getting back and, and digging that much deeper and mm-hmm. because there's there's just so much there it's just so rich and, and if you'd like to get involved you just send me an email you can see on the website and create a process that info you can submit your work there you can volunteer there you can yeah. do lots of different or things if you're there. interested in bring it to your university or bring it or to your university center. sure yeah, okay. okay mia thank you so much thank you, and thank oh you. i also got to say miafunk.com oh, well, you need to check nice. out her work Please and, check it and, out. And, and I should thank you for uh, everything that you've contributed, not just to our exhibition, but to our expanding our knowledge oh. of the creative process of different <laughs> um, individuals for different uh, disciplines. That thank is you. very kind of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Um, and I look forward to seeing the Creative Process Exhibition in the Bay Area. Yes, we're that's working on the with UC, at yeah, some we're point, working isn't with UC Berkeley. And we have colleagues in Stanford. We're just yeah. All right. Well, I look forward to that. I can't thank wait you. for that. All right. Thank you again, Mia okay. Funk. That is all for today. Thanks again to my guest, artist and the Creative Process Exhibition founder, Mia Funk. Thanks to Wordspace Studios in San Francisco for uh, hosting me when I'm at home. They again are at wordspacestudios.com. No show next week, like I said, because I will be jet lagged and much more importantly, reading at the Stranger Than Fiction reading series from three to five at the Edinburgh Castle Pub. So if you're local, please stop by. Thank you for watching and listening. If you like the show, please share on social media and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you happen to watch or listen. It makes a huge difference, and I really, really appreciate it. For more about me, my website is matthewfelix.com, and links to my social media, books, podcasts, and all the rest can be found there. If you have any comments, ideas for the show, or just want to say hello, I would love to hear from you at felixonair at matthewfelix.com. Thanks again for watching and listening, and have a great week.